everyone. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm Andrew Parks, the Assistant Director of Lectures and Seminars. I just wanted to thank you for joining us today in the Lewis Wilson Auditorium and remind everyone who's attending in person to please check that your cell phones have been silenced. For those watching online, you're welcome to submit questions by emailing speaker at heritage.org. For everyone's future reference, today's program is being broadcast and recorded and that will be available afterwards uh, on the heritage.org website. And hosting today's program is David Burton. He's the Senior Fellow in Economic Policy in the Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies here at the Heritage Foundation. David. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for coming. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to bring to your attention the next two events in this speaker series, which we call Free Markets, the Ethical Economic Choice. On this Tuesday, December 4th, John Allison will be here to talk about the philosophical fight for the future of America. He is the uh, retired chairman and CEO of BB&T Bank and also the retired president of the Cato Institute. On uh, Monday, December 10th, the, uh, the Reverend Robert Sricco will be here. He is the president of the Acton Institute, and he will speak on the moral case for a free economy. Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Munger of Duke University. His topic is, if poverty is the real problem, then capitalism is the only solution. Dr. Munger has worked as a staff economist for the Federal Trade Commission, and taught at Dartmouth, the University of Texas at Austin, and UNC Chapel Hill, before becoming a political science professor at Duke University uh, <clears throat> in 1997. In 2000, he became the head of Duke's political science department, and he is currently the director of philosophy, politics, and economics, or PPE, uh, program at Duke University. He's the past president of the Public Choice Society, and since 2013, has been a co-editor of the Independent Review. He's been published in the American Political Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, and the Journal of Politics. He also serves as an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. He's the author, or co-author, by my count, of seven books. They are Tomorrow 3.0, Transactions, Cost, and the Sharing Economy, published this year. Choosing in Groups, Analytical poly Politics Revisited, Is Limited Government Possible, Analyzing Policy, Choices, Conflicts, and Practices, The Thing Itself, Essays on Academics and the State, Ideology and the Theory of Political Choice, and Analytical Politics. Dr. Munger earned a BA in Economics at Davidson College and both an MA and PhD in Economics at Washington University. We'll take audience questions at the end of his presentation, and please join me in welcoming Mike Munger. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, if you get the idea that I moved around a lot and couldn't really hold a job, that's probably the, the best part, most accurate part of that introduction. In graduate school, I did uh, have the privilege of working for Murray Wiedenbaum who at Washington University was the head of the Center for Study of American Business. And at the time, I think there was a kind of sense of triumphalism among many of us. And then when I came here and worked in the Reagan administration, I worked for Jim Miller at the FTC, I think we had a sense that the, the notion that capitalism was the solution to the problem of poverty was just self-evident. Now, some of that tells you about who I was talking to. but. When I moved out into the world and took a job as a political Scientologist at first University of Texas and then uh, UNC and then at Duke, so I've been in political science for more than 30 years, that notion that capitalism is the obvious solution to the problem of poverty is by no means self-evident. And I think in the past few years, maybe in the past 10, we have, if anything, retrenched. So some of what I want to do is talk about some things that you already know, uh, but try to put them in a kind of broader context. And then what I'm going to do is suggest a possible explanation. And this is pretty 
uh, as David said, this is in some ways a discussion of problems of ethics. So this is far from being a technical talk. And I, I, there's no reason to believe a professor when he says this, but I really am going to try to be brief. Usually we speak in hour and 15 minute segments, but uh, I'll do my best. So one of the interesting things that we have to try to do is distinguish between two agenda items, I guess you could call them, that people call problems. And one of the things in policy analysis that you learn is that the statement of the problem itself goes a long way towards suggesting or ruling out solutions. And whoever gets to use their problem statement and have other people adopt their problem statement means that they can privilege the solution that they would like to pick in the first place. So the two problems are poverty and inequality. Now, if we think that the problem that we have in the world is inequality, that suggests a different set of solutions than if we think the problem that we have is poverty. I've always had trouble understanding why people thought inequality was a problem. Because what that seems to me is that there are some people who have managed to win, some people who have managed to produce a lot of value. And I tell, I, I teach a class to 150 first year students, introduction to political economy, introduction to capitalism every fall, and I'm about to finish it. When I ask them, what's the, what's the argument for markets? You all went to top high schools, these are Duke students, what is the argument for markets? Well, the simple one sentence argument for, for markets is that market processes create more consumer surplus than any other system. And consumer surplus, as you all know, is the difference between what people are willing to pay and what they have to pay. So I ask the question this way. So if you go to Walmart, and instead of the elderly person there who tries to give you a cart, what they did instead was demand a ticket. How much would you pay for a ticket to Walmart? Well, suppose that that was the only store in the world, and what, you could, what you're buying is the right to buy all this enormous diversity of products at really low prices. You'd probably pay $10,000 or more for the ability to go into a Walmart, because if that was the only place that you could get things, having access to capitalism was the only way that you could get things, that's enormously valuable. So when we compare that to the size of the profits that entrepreneurs take out of the system as a reward for creating consumer surplus, it's relatively a pittance. What's really being created is an enormous amount of consumer surplus. And in some ways, the largest benefits are going to those who are poor. I do ask my Duke colleagues about this when they critique Walmart. When's the last time you all were in a Walmart? Well, we don't go to Walmart, of course. We'll buy our Christmas presents at FAO Schwartz or online. But on December 24th, if you go into a Walmart, what you see is a whole lot of very poor people buying Christmas presents for their children. So the real beneficiaries of this, of, of having access to capitalism, are the poor. But let's, let's take seriously this problem for a moment about comparing uh, inequality and poverty. So let's suppose, as a simulation, that we start out with uh, society, call it A, and there's three relatively equally sized groups, the wealthy, the middle class, and the poor. Wealthy have a median income of 100,000, middle class has a median income of 50,000, and the poor, 20,000. Now suppose that we could move to society B. Now everyone's better off, it's a parade of improvement, so presumably everybody would want to move to society B compared to A. But suppose there's another system, we'll call it society C, that produces a whole lot more inequality. Well, suppose you're actually concerned about poverty. Which of these would you pick? Obviously, you'd pick C. But suppose that what you're concerned about is inequality. Then you would say, no, society B is going to be better. And it seems odd that you hate poor people. Because you're so concerned about ensuring that no one has kind of any, any kind of what you see as unearned benefits you're willing to harm the people, the very people that you care about. Now, I think there's some question about whether that's an accurate representation, but when you, when you present it that way, it makes the question rather stark. Now, what people usually want to do is say, well, we could have society C and have redistribution. No, actually, the point is, if you impose society C on redistribution, you get society B. 
because the disincentives to those who are producing extra value, now maybe it wouldn't be that stark, but it's a, it's a pretty big, so society B is with, with redistribution, society C is not. <clears throat> if we look at actual household income distribution, 1967 through 2015, which is the most recent that I could find uh, good data on uh, quintiles, you see that the mean of those in two, of the lowest quintile in 2011 was a little over 11,000, a little over 12,000, or about 10 percent higher in 2015. If you adjust that for inflation, that was 2.6 percent. So it's just a canard that those who are least well off are not improving in terms of the average income. And when you think about it, the people who lose their jobs and have zero income and immigrants who come here and very, are very poor are actually part of that class. So there's a lot of dynamism in that bottom quintile, and yet it, the mean still does go up. So if we look in 2011 for the second quintile, it's about 29,000, goes to 32,000, or an increase of 3.5%. It is true that for the top 5%, we go from 300,000, 350,000, for an increase of 4.3%. So there is an increase across the board. This is a whole lot like my society's B and society C. So there are benefits to those who are least well off. If you are worried about the fact that the very wealthy are getting wealthy by more, it concerns me that you're not really worried about poor people. So the let me make the point of the, apparently what happened was the one of the one of the slides didn't continue, so there's a melange. Um, let me explain. Let me go back a little bit. So suppose that we take, and this is another thing that you can probably guess, I'm just a very annoying person to my colleagues at Duke. <laughs> I try to explain to them sometime what tenure means. Um, suppose we take someone in the United States who earns minimum wage. So they have a full-time minimum wage job. That means that they earn something between sixteen and eighteen thousand dollars a year. And then we compare them to the world income distribution. Now in the US that puts them in the bottom quintile. In the world that puts them at about the 84th percentile. So again, if they really cared about poverty, then they would be more worried about people in other countries. And in fact, there are no poor people in the United States. By world standard, poor people in the United States are middle class. And that means that, of course, moving poor people from the bottom to the top in terms of the world income distribution raises the question about whether we should be, we should be even posing this as a problem of poverty to begin with. So whatever else you think about the problem of immigration, if the United States is such an awful place to be poor, why is everyone lined up there on the outside of the wall? There's none on the inside trying to get out. They're lined up on the outside of the wall trying to get in because it's much better to be a poor person in the United States than it is to be a middle class person in many countries of the world. So our problems with immigration are actually a sign of the value of capitalism as a, as a solution for poverty. Now that doesn't mean that we should have open borders. What it means is other countries need to have capitalism. To the extent that other countries are able to develop market systems, the pressure for immigration into the United States would be reduced. So when we see this sort of picture, then that young woman who's trying to get into the United States the fault is the fault lies in the bad institutions of her home country, in the refusal of her home country to develop a market system. So when I look, and I, I committed heresy here, I used a, a different economic freedom index, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I recover later, but I started out, just to show that I'm ecumenical, I, I started out with a different economic freedom of the world index. But to the extent that they're correlated, if you notice that from 1980 through 2015, this is worldwide 
average, all over the world, in many countries, there's substantial increases in economic freedom. And the blue line is the most interesting story. And this is the one that I think I, it's most surprising that my students, at least, have never heard. That the story of the late 20th and early 21st century is the unprecedented decline in poverty in, in worldwide terms. So if you define poverty as being, um, let's define it 2011 purchasing power parity dollars. Let's define it as being $1.90 per day, just under $2 per day. That really clearly is poverty. But the number of people who suffer that kind of poverty has gone down from nearly half to less than 10%. There's been a gigantic increase in economic freedom. Now, if not capitalism, then at least market systems, at least the use of price rather than command to organize cooperative human activity, and a decline in poverty that means that the welfare that's available to those who are very poor has increased in a way that's unprecedented. Now, there's something else that's also happened, and that's an increase in inequality. And you've all seen this graph, the wedge between productivity and compensation. And it is interesting to talk about, and a lot of you know more about this than I do, so I'd be interested in comments and some of you saying why we see that. Why is it that there is such, depending on how you measure it, what appears to be a decline in the rate of increase of hourly compensation. And that's hourly compensation. It's not just wages. So in wages, you can explain it in part by the fact that health care costs have gone up by so much. But there's some difference just in hourly compensation. And if you look at family income, there seems to be, uh, if not stagnation, as I said before, it's going up 2%. And it's not increasing at the same rate as productivity. But the real story is that, that the world poverty rate has fallen at a rate that's unprecedented. So most of my colleagues at Duke would talk about the first graph. My question is, why don't we talk more about the second graph? Why is it that we're unable to make that the story? Because it seems to me that that's just an unassailable case for capitalism as a solution to poverty. Now, one question is, is it just China alone? That's the explanation. Because it is true that if you just look at China, the share of the population in China living in extreme poverty has gone from more than 80% to less than 10%. But if you compare the blue line there is China, the red line is the rest of the world, it's true that the decline in the rest of the world was less, but the rest of the world started at lower levels of poverty. And the rate of decline may have been less, but it's still dramatic. So all over the world, in country after country, it's pretty clear that we've had a decline in poverty. Now, when did that happen? It started happen happening in China when the market-oriented reforms of Deng Xiaoping were introduced in 1978. It's as perfect an experiment as you could want, because in, that, in this graph, we're comparing it with India. So the two, the two tracks moved along pretty well together until they didn't, until one country introduced market reforms. And as it always does, market reforms started to increase the rate of prosperity and to get rid of poverty. So this is actually from the Heritage Foundation. So I'm using here the correct index, the, the, the increase in economic freedom as measured here. Um, and so thanks to Terry Miller, who's the lead author of that report. Um, if you look over a five-year, 10-year, or 20-year period, this is the average annual growth of, it's a little hard to interpret, the average annual growth of GDP per capita as a function of the increase it's the increase in economic freedom as a function of the uh, differences of the different quartiles. So in whether you look at the five-year, the 10-year, or the 20-year, the biggest increase in GDP comes in the bottom quartile. And that's more true the more economic freedom you have. So more economic freedom 
increases rate of growth, reduces poverty, and it does it most, of course, at those who suffer most from po po poverty, those who are in the bottom quartile. And here, if you have a broader index of social progress, I think it's fair to say we shouldn't be concerned only about economic prosperity. There's more to life than that. That's fair enough. And to be fair, the Heritage Report also shows that if you look at the overall score on the horizontal axis there in the 2018 Index of Economic Freedom, and the vertical axis is the Social Progress Index score, social progress is a rate of change. That's improvement in social institutions. Now, maybe it's democracy, maybe it's health care, so the, that index is pretty complicated. It adds a lot of things together, but it means that you've got something more than just economic prosperity that we're talking about. So I think this case is unassailable. And you might say, well, you would, but what even is the counter-argument? And the counter-argument that we usually hear is that, well, you're not worried about inequality. You should be more worried about inequality. I've thought about that quite a bit, why it is that many of us thought with the University of Chicago winning the Cold War, that that would be, because our, our strategy was, we had a military strategy, but in some ways it was an economic strategy that played out just because we were, we were aware that we could outcompete, and it happened. Now, the statistics, the data that we had about the growth rates in the Soviet Union were just wrong, so that we were the last to know that we were right, but we were right, and that worked out pretty well. So late 80s, early 90s, there was a wave of optimism that sort of congealed at the World Bank in the form of the Washington Consensus with a set of prescriptions about what developing nations should do. Now, I'm a student of Douglas North at Washington University. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 1986. And after you win the Nobel Prize, you go on kind of a world tour, and you get asked by people in developing nations, Professor North, can, can you tell us what we should do in order to achieve economic development? And Doug always had the same answer. He said, the first thing you'll need is a different history. Well, that's true in every unimportant respect, because what it means is, Countries have a hard time developing the institutions or the preconditions, the sort of rule of law, um, being able to avoid graft, corruption, not having people sell offices. Those are things that are very difficult to overcome. But there's something more than that. We are, we as human beings, are very susceptible to arguments in favor of reducing inequality. And someone uses the social justice stick it means that we usually cower and say, OK, yes, you're right. That is a problem. I wanted to speculate a little bit about why. So we evolved, and we have certain characteristics physically that presumably increase our level of biological fitness. It's also interesting that human beings have moral sensibilities. Now, is it an advantage to have moral sensibilities? When you were a freshman in college, probably one of the first things that you read was Plato's Republic. And the question that Plato asks is, why are human beings moral? Is it good to be moral? And he makes an argument about why it is, why Thrasymachus and his claim that justice is simply the interest of the strongest is not the way that we should think about this, that moral people are better and societies composed of moral people are better. Well, that may be true, but Immoral individuals are likely to have an advantage in a society of altruists. And in fact, altruism or morality might not survive. So the biologist E.O. Wilson famously said that evolution is always a contest between two factors. One is that selfish individuals will always defeat altruistic individuals. Second is, groups of altruistic individuals will always defeat groups of selfish individuals. So to the extent that you have a group of people who trust each other, they'll be able to do better militarily, economically, because we'll be able to write contracts 
at much less cost. It's much, more, it's much easier. You wouldn't have to enforce them at every step. So human beings appear to be different from the homo economicus assumption. And in fact, homo economicus is a sociopath, almost the definition of a sociopath in the sense that anything that I take, if I can get away with it, it's OK. And this is an ancient debate. James Madison said in Federalist 51 that ambition should be made to counteract ambition. We should take self-interest as being given because we can't rely on having enlightened statesmen at the helm. And there's something to that. But Rousseau said that it would be better if we could inscribe the law on men's hearts. That is, it's part of the objective function, doing the right thing, having a moral sensibility, accepting the traditions that are handed down to us from the past. If we internalize those, we'll have a better society. Constantly starting over and making up a new set of rules every generation is hopeless. That's what the French Revolution tried to do. So the Burkean response to that attempt by the French Revolution to start over at zero and rename the years at zero and rename all the months. Why not use the traditions of the past? Well, all right, that may or may not be true. My question is not is morality good, but why is it that human beings have morality? And my, my claim, I'm going to make a pretty narrowly biological claim about that. Evolution by natural selection is going to choose brain modules whose function facilitated in the past tense reproduction in historical time, that is, increases in biological fitness. But in the last 10,000 years, our social and economic situation has changed a great deal. But our minds are, given the relatively long human reproductive cycle, our minds are still evolved for the Stone Age. And in fact, this is often called in biology the Stone Age mind hypothesis. Well, if that's true, how should we think about the relationship between the actual economic relations in a complex society, what Hayek called the uh, open society, the great society, and the way that we think about our relations to each other, our proper relationships to each other in society? Well, it's likely that market institutions have evolved and changed much faster than the brain modules that react to market processes. Uh, the, our moral brains, then, our sense of what is fair, is likely to be evolved in a setting where in a small clan, if I go on a hunt and I don't share, I'm a bad person. So this idea of individual property rights is something that's based more on reason than it is on evolution. Now, we may be able to overcome that, but it means that we have a predisposition in favor of that kind of moral reasoning. And I want to give an example where this is probably good and an example where it's probably bad. <clears throat> if there's no pressure to delete a gene, even if it's a behavioral predisposition, it can survive for a very long time. And those are called atavisms. So in experiments, Primates appear to have strong emotional fairness reactions. So if you have two primates side by side in clear plastic cages, and you both of them perform the same task, and they both expect an M&M, but then you give one of them a cucumber, he'll go nuts. He'll throw the cucumber, he'll be really upset, and he'll start talking about social justice. I made the last part up. But it, <laughs> it, 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 the point is, that's a violation of expectations. So if we frame our violation, our expectations in terms of equality, then we're, what we have to do is justify any deviation from equality. Whereas the natural course of things, it's likely, given the differences in our abilities, that we're going to find equality just to be a natural consequence of the working out of market processes. So examples of atavism. You probably know this, but whales have hips. They don't have legs. But they did have legs because they used to be mammals that either lived in shallow water or on the land. They returned to the water. And they still have atavistic hips. Human beings, human embryos, have pretty long tails. Now, those tails come back up into the body, and you have just the, the sort of vestigial toxic. But in evolutionary terms, the information about creating those things is still there. 
And I think the most interesting one is this. I don't know if you've ever seen a snake with a leg. So the DNA of snakes still has information about legs encoded in it, but that gene is switched off. If you get a genetic mutation that turns the switch back on, you'll see, and it's fairly common, one of a thousand births or so, a snake will be born that has an atavistic leg. This is not good for the snake, but it persists because it doesn't happen often enough for the gene to be selected out. So obviously I'm stretching, but I want to argue that our moral intuitions about social justice are basically whale hips or snake legs. We have this atavistic sense, which once was not just useful, but crucial. It was essential to cooperation. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it. But it is something that has to be overcome by reason. And to the extent that demagogues can employ this predisposition, we're, we start out at a loss in arguing for capitalism as a solution to poverty. So think for a moment, if you see a violation of the rules, and the rules are socially constructed, so I don't want to say that we, this is biological determinism, but if you see a violation of a rule that you think is important, your body is immediately suffused with a cocktail of chemicals that robs you of volition. It triggers your fight or flight response. If you've ever been in debates with a leftist, you've seen this. Their face turns red, they breathe hard, they're very angry at you. How could you possibly believe that? You're a terrible person. But that means that if you see a violation of the rules, you provide the public good of norm enforcement. Not because you think, oh, I should provide the public good of norm enforcement. You become angry. My two examples. I, was, I lived in Germany in 2009. I was free teaching at Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, but I was visiting Munich. And I'm from North Carolina. I grew up in rural Florida. And if I am at a street and there's no cars coming, I'm going to cross even if the light is red. Now, in this case, admittedly, I pushed my way through a large group of school children to do that. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. And I get to the front. I look both ways, and I start to cross. And I hear a commotion. And then I feel a sharp pain in my left elbow. And I look, and there's this little tiny Uber Oma, little grandmother, who is just ready to hit me again with her umbrella. She has just hit me once, and she's about to hit me again with her umbrella. And she's screaming, kinder murder, kinder murder, child murderer. Because if the children see you cross the street, the very fabric of society be ripped asunder. Now, I probably could have taken her. I'm quite a bit younger and like 100 pounds heavier. What was my reaction? I, too, was, I responded in a way that was biological. I tried to make myself physically smaller. My face turned red. I went back. I tried to apologize to the children. So what happened was there was a violation of the rules. And an elderly woman attacked an adult male. That doesn't seem like it's biologically adaptive, except that the response is that I felt guilt. None of this really was reason. This, was some, this is the way that primitive societies work. That's pretty useful. We need to have people who enforce the rules, not just the police, but socially, we need to care about customs and norms. So that's pretty crucial. On the other hand, many of you who are poisoned by testosterone have had this experience. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, and then you decide that they must be taught a lesson. And sometimes, five minutes after this has happened, my wife will ask me, you're still trying to get that guy, aren't you? <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> well, you'll never see them again. That's a rule violation that just doesn't matter. But we're not very good at distinguishing. In fact, that's the point. The reason that it's an involuntary biological response is that if we used reason, we could come up with some reason why we wouldn't have to provide the public good of norm enforcement. So the very fact that it's involuntary is what made it so useful in the past and so difficult to overcome now. So 
I was interested recently in rereading uh, volumes one and three of Law, Legislation, and Liberty by Friedrich Hayek that he often uses, and I'm happy to share this PowerPoint so I have the entire quote, which is bad form in giving a presentation, but it's useful to give you the context. But the, the, he says, the ideals of socialism or social justice, which in such a position prove so attractive, do not really offer a new moral, but merely appeal to instincts inherited from an earlier type of society. They are an atavism, a vain attempt to impose upon the open society the morals of the tribal society. And then, again, the demand for just distribution in which organized power is to be used to allocate each what he deserves is thus strictly an atavism based on primordial emotions. Now, by calling it emotion, we're not trying to denigrate it or say that it's not to be taken seriously. The question is, rhetorically, how does one deal with basically a response about that's just morally wrong with a set of consequentialist arguments? I mean, generally, arguments for markets are consequentialist. Look at the benefits that come from them. Yes, but I feel like they're morally wrong. When the prophets and philosophers protested against the prevailing morals, clearly none of them had any grasp of the extent to which the practices they had condemned made possible the situation of which they were part. So the other key insight that Hayek has is that relatively few of us, without quite a bit of thought and training, understand the complex setting in which markets produce these outcomes. It takes a long time to understand that intuition. And economic education is not something that we've excelled at. It's not something that's emphasized very well in high schools. <clears throat> so the question we face is whether, or maybe better when, the evolved programs we call morals serve or thwart solving collective action problems. When do morals prevent political support of new institutions that help us solve collective action problems? Markets are institutions for reducing the transaction's cost of impersonal exchange. The core argument for markets is then that voluntary exchange makes both parties better off, and the public policy implication is the state should take only minimal actions, because the more of these voluntary exchanges, the better. It's syllogistic. There's just a set of logical arguments there. I have found that almost no one who doesn't already believe this argument is persuaded by it when I present it in that form, because it's a consequentialist argument. Now, I'm embarrassed to admit, since I was catechized as an economist, I guess I'm telling a story on myself. Usually economists make a particular kind of assumption about human behavior, and what is that? It is that people are rational. There is a time, however, when people are not rational, and when is that? When they disagree with economists. Oh, you're just irrational. It's amazing how quickly we jump to that. Oh, that's just people are just irrational. Well, no, we have to take seriously the moral, emotive, justice part of the counterargument. So unless you already believe that, if you just say, well, people aren't bright enough to understand my brilliant argument, absolutely no one is going to be persuaded by you insulting them. I think the problem that we have is that we're evolved to live in a lifeboat world in the sense that in a lifeboat, if we use prices to try to organize things, we can't get more of the stuff. There are, the, the elasticity of supply is zero. There is no more water coming. There's no more food coming. So you should not charge more for something I need. But we live in a Walmart world. And in a Walmart world, the supply elasticity is enormous. The, the amazing thing about Walmart is its ability to organize a supply chain that reduces the cost of things for poor people. So if you have a lifeboat mind, but you live in a Walmart world, you're going to have a hard time accepting the argument that the best solution to poverty is capitalism. So I achieved a minor kind of fame three years ago. Um, to be in my defense, this was an article in the New York Times business section. So it's, I'm not being unfair to assume this person should know something about economics. <laughs> Although maybe I was. Does anybody notice a problem with that headline? The word but, which they were kind enough to put not in lowercase to call attention to it. So bird flu is sending egg prices up. 
But I'll be damned, this amazing coincidence, slowing demand is preventing shortages. Whereas in fact, someone who's a sophomore undergraduate who has an economics class knows that it's literally impossible for us to ever run out of anything if prices are free to adjust. They may not be available at the price we want, but we can't run out of them. There can't be a shortage if prices are free to adjust. It is the very adjustment of prices. So I uh, was intemperate about this, and my good friend Vera Derugi was amused by the fact that I was intemperate about this. And so I was, I was briefly famous. But that's stupid. <laughs> and so I mean, the difficulty is if that's what we're dealing with. Because I think this was not sarcasm. It just, no clue that this is, this is how market processes work. So the point is that prices redirect towards higher valued uses. If price goes up, then high price leads consumers to look for alternatives. Anticipating a high price means that producers will make more, and actual high prices encourage entrepreneurs. And so prices are the mechanism by which we address shortages, particularly those for the very poor. So does thinking that make you a bad person? My colleagues all say yes. Found this cartoon, which is an illustration. And my question is, is the space alien a bad person? Leo's in outer space. He crash lands. And then, of course, he realizes he can't breathe. And there's a space alien there. And the sign says, because you can't hold your breath forever. And he's selling spacesuits for $25. Now, $25 seems like a pretty good deal. And you may also want to know, why could he breathe in outer space but not on the moon? It's just a cartoon. Let it go. <laughs> but is the space alien acting badly? Let's assume that the space alien had nothing to do with shooting Leo down, that Leo crashed on his own for some reason, and now the space alien is offering a spacesuit. I think an awful lot of people would say the space alien is acting badly. If we make this illegal, we're condemning Leo to death. His only hope for living is to be able to take advantage of access to the market. This is not really a hypothetical example. <clears throat> in 2009, again, living in Germany, I, I was a problem in Germany. because I was constantly I thought I recognized things, and I didn't. It was just different. A friend of mine and I went hiking in the Bayerischer Wald, so in the Bavarian forest. We had a big German breakfast. The big German breakfast buffets are a big problem for me. They're, it's really great to eat. But we left the inn by about 9.30. We were walking. And we, didn't, we weren't exactly lost. But we didn't know where we were. We noticed that the <laughs> path was getting narrower and narrower. And about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we hadn't had lunch yet. And then by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we Stop kidding ourselves. We weren't even on a path. We were just walking in the woods. So we were lost. We were really hungry. And we were a little bit scared. And then we saw Mirabile Dick II, a hut. And the hut, even better, sold sandwiches and beer. Now, the sandwiches were 18 euros. And the beer was 12 euros. And this was 2009, before the euro cratered. So it was quite a bit of money. What did I do? I bought a euro and a beer and thanked the guy. You are a good man. I'm glad you're here. My German friend sat on the front steps and pouted. This should not be allowed. They should not be allowed to charge such high prices. What the hell are you talking about? Five minutes ago, we didn't have this choice. How are you being made worse off by having a choice you didn't have and wanted? Now, it's true. Maybe you think that's too expensive. Fair enough. I don't think it's too expensive. So I had another beer and offered him some. He, he stuck to his principles. He didn't have any, even if I paid for it. We have a deep intuition that if we need something, people should give it to us. And it's very hard to overcome that intuition. And the problem is worse than that. Politicians, some out of honesty and some out of demagoguery, recognize that they can win by appealing to that instinct. So I think that the difficulty that we have is that we have long focused on economic education as being primarily, primarily an exercise in logic and consequentialism. But we need to focus on, in a more effective way, on the reasons why, if you care about the poor, if you actually care about the poor, 
capitalism is the right solution to solve that problem, you can argue that inequality is perhaps a price that we pay for that, but the benefits to the poor far and away dwarf any of, the, of these undeserved um, benefits that you're so concerned about. So I think there's two considerations. One is the moral outrage or negative affect we have at being taken advantage of in the lifeboat. The other is the expectation of material benefit if we're going to get to buy something. So just to summarize, if you're poor in the United States, it's like being middle class anywhere else in the world. So that explains pressure for migration into rather than away from any but the most desperately poor. So yes, I'm, I'm worried that there's poverty in the US, but by worldwide standards, it's not plausible to argue there's poverty in the US. The rate of growth, as was shown in that heritage study, has varied across quintiles, but membership in the quintiles is pretty fluid. What looks like stagnation actually disguises a lot of dynamism. There's at least three factors that distort the comparisons of those quintiles over time. One is healthcare cost, as I already mentioned. The other is family size. So one of the, the, the statistics that always is quoted is that household income has remained flat. Well, yes, it has, if by household you mean the way we define household. But you're taking a two-earner family and splitting them, or else they never get married in the first place. And it's not surprising that a one-earner family is not going to catch up to what a two-earner family was going to, to earn. So the, the way that we're defining families doesn't account for that. And we have massive in-migration for the bottom 20%. It's actually miraculous that it hasn't fallen, given that much of the growth in our population has been from in-migration. Poverty's declined all over the world at a rate that's never been seen before in the world. And for some reason, capitalism doesn't get credit for that. That decline in poverty is concentrated and remains most pronounced in nations that have used market systems governed by prices. There are no examples of countries that are socialist <coughs> solving the problem of poverty. There are no examples. There are examples of countries becoming poor by adopting socialism. So there's two ways of thinking of this problem, inequality versus poverty. And too often, we allow the problem to be defined as inequality rather than poverty. So I think concern about poverty is motivated by a genuine moral concern for those who are least well off. Concern about inequality is either confusion or it's envy, which is a sin, being dressed up in the mask of justice, which is a social virtue. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> We have time for a number of audience questions. I would ask that you state your name and your institutional affiliation and wait for the mic. Patrick. Patrick Mackler, and I work for Senator Ron Johnson. The scholar Jonathan Haidt uh, suggests that conservatives and liberals have differing ideas about what fairness is. Um, one thinking that it's a getting what you deserve and the other thinking that you come up with equal results. I wonder, is that is that approximately so in your view? And to what extent is there simply a differing idea as to how you succeed uh, in that some people think it's just by luck and some think that it's, it's by you embracing good habits? Jonathan is a friend of mine. We've had him to Duke a couple of times, and it is in, he's, he is himself politically sort of center left. But he's noticed that a lot of our differences in polarization seem to come from just sort of different expectations or basic models about the world, as you say. So both of those things could be true in some consequentialist sense, that it would be good if we were all equal. It would be good if we all could get what we deserve. The question is, how are we to try? How, how can we arrange the system or rearrange the system? I guess what worries me is this idea that we can easily rearrange the system. So the the people on the left tend to be more optimistic about the capacity of the state to achieve their objectives, where so it's it's the the I've I've asked Jonathan about this, and he's not a fan of, of Thomas Sowell's distinction between the constrained and unconstrained vision. But that's, that's what I would challenge Jonathan with. 
is the constrained and unconstrained vision as opposed to the, and I think he's right, that there, there's a lot of ways to cut this, but he's right that people just have a conception that equality is the way that the world should be or that I should be able to get what I deserve and if I deserve more, it's fine for me to have it. Um, those sorts of claims, the equality people often can be I find that I can have some success in having this discussion if I remind them, yes, but we should be worried about solving the problem of poverty. Why don't you care about poor people? There's nothing more fun than saying to a leftist, why don't you care about poor people? Patrick in the back. Patrick Carroll, the Heritage Foundation. How much of the concern about uh, inequality do you think is based on a misunderstanding by the public that the 1% is the same people every year and, um, you know, the, without and not thinking about the di people of different ages are going to have different incomes at different times in their lives and thinking of statistical categories as the same people every year when they're not. Oh, uh, most. And the, the problem of the idea of the stability of the 1% is something that's difficult to argue about empirically because it, it, it's constantly changing. To the extent that a large fortune is left and that fortune is preserved over time, then the 1% would be consistent. You'd be locked into it. That doesn't really seem to happen. So the I think an interesting question is people's attitudes towards estate and gift tax. Because when, when you talk in the abstract about the estate tax, uh, they're worried about it precisely, precisely because of the 1%. But if you actually use human beings and say this is a family-owned business, it's fairly easy to have something that goes up to the $7 million uh, where the estate tax kicks in, then they would say, oh, well, that's wrong. We shouldn't be taking that. But that's if you have an estate of $7 million, you're in the 1%. So I think a lot of it is that is exactly the misunderstanding that you talk about. And the, the dynamism of the economy, I think there is a problem. The, the dynamism of the US economy is less than it used to be. So the, the, social, the rate of change of social mobility is less than it used to be. A fair amount of that is likely due to the failure of the public education system rather than a failure of capitalism. But it's still true that it's less likely that someone goes from the bottom to the top quintile than it was 50 years ago. So that we might even agree on the problem and suggest a different solution. Mike. Thank you, Professor. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> we hear politicians like, let's say, Senator Sanders say, in the richest country in the world, we should have free health care because that's the right thing to do. We don't have news reporters that ever say, could you explain how that works? Why is it that we don't even have economic um, precociousness among news media about economic claims like that? Um, is there any press here? I guess they could probably hear it. OK, I'll say it. <laughs> or watch it. Right? <laughs> They're grossly underpaid. When I ask a group of ambitious young students, how many of you intend to go into the media? It's very difficult for someone to imagine doing this now if they have some knowledge of finance. So it's not a very attractive alternative. So you were asking a lot of people to be able to interpret, and I think with the, probably the news media also does this just as much, to be fair, to economic claims made by people on the right. Basically, they just repeat them rather than questioning them because it's a hard thing to unpack. And the, one of the things that organizations like the Heritage Foundation do is provide ready-made alternatives. So there's a report. There's something that I can use and say, well, all right, in this report, they said this. Why, why not then, if you can use that to challenge claims by elites? But I think it's, it's too much to expect reporters to be challenged, challenging those sorts of claims of people either on the left or the right, because the, the process by which people now become news reporters is not that you go through a long novitiate and you develop expertise. There's a lot of turnover. A lot of it is 
your ability to command, to be telegenic, to command a large audience, and to have a lot of followers on Instagram. So the, I don't know that that's a failure of the news people themselves. But what we seem to want from news is not that sort of question. In fact, if a, if a reporter were to, to, to challenge that, people would turn the channel. So we get the news we deserve. This gentleman here in the front. Hey, thank you for your time, Professor. My name is Esteban Elizondo. I'm the intern for the Thatcher Center here at the Heritage Foundation. Um, uh, correct me if I'm mischaracterizing how uh, what you said, but it seems like some uh, uh, some of these uh, social justice tendencies are symptoms of the Stone Age mind, as you described it. <laughs> I might have put it quite that together. They're 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 symptoms of atavisms that have to do with being cooperative. And to be fair, nationalism, um, the people who are concerned about racial purity, those are atavisms too. So they cross the board. There are plenty of things where. We're used to being in small, ethnically homogeneous groups that are cooperative. And so for all those reasons, yes, we're susceptible to those sorts of claims by demagogues. I don't want to single out just that one. OK, so a, a lot of things, but social justice is perhaps one of them. How come in academia, in an area where we're supposed to you know, put reason above all else, and as a professor, you can you know, probably have seen this, how come social justice has taken such a strong root in uh, academic institutions, particularly, you know, uh, top uh, top academic institutions, you know, like Duke or uh, other universities. I, I don't think we've done a very good job of answering those objections. Some of those objections are pretty legitimate. So the the we tend to take purely consequentialist routes, and that's not very persuasive to people who are worried about morality and culture. And of course, addressing that very issue is part of what this series is about. The gentleman behind on my right. No, there, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. So I have uh, I have a lead question that'll inf your answer will inform my second question. Would you say that poverty is an? Are you viewing poverty as an economic problem, or would you say that there is a moral element to the issue of poverty? Yes, there's a moral element to the issue of poverty. So that, that being the case, and I, I suspect that you would say that, then I'd like to have hear you talk more about the moral component of capitalism and how we view the, um, because you can either say that the markets form moral outcomes or that the markets don't form moral outcomes. And if the markets themselves don't form moral outcomes without moral people being involved, how do you reconcile your um, your statement that is kind of like just leftover parts of us um, with how morality impacts the type of capitalism that is seeking to resolve the problem of poverty? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well. That's a really good question, and I, the brief answer is that I think what we need, markets are a relatively neutral tool, and what they do is use prices to transmit information about the relative scarcity of resources, but they're also potentially a means by which if people can get government assistance in monopolizing an industry or getting subsidies that where you can increase profits in an accounting sense that don't have any economic benefit. So it, this is something that I've concluded is a problem. I've, I'm a public choice economist. And the one thing you can't say in public choice is what we need is better people. But that actually is the conclusion that I'm suggesting is what we need is better people. Markets are going to function in a particular way, given the moral character of the people participating in them. And so um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, many people in the former Soviet Union were angry because they said, well, the damned socialists lied to us about socialism because they said socialism was going to produce prosperity, but it didn't. But 
we never expected they were telling us the truth about capitalism because they told us capitalism was going to wipe out all our wealth, and it did. Well, you can argue that that's not capitalism, but what happened was people basically stole all the assets and sold them off and became oligarchs, and then they became big fans of property rights because no one is a bigger defender of property rights than someone who's stolen it fair and square. So if you have people that don't have moral constraints, markets are going to work terribly. Markets don't solve the problem of prosperity then. So the, this problem of morality actually logically pre-exists my claims about markets. Markets don't produce morality. But in a moral setting, markets perform much better. And I worry that our side has not emphasized, and this is less true at Heritage, but at the Public Choice Society and a lot of the, the places that I hang out, we're mostly concerned about economic consequentialism rather than the traditions that are handed down from the past as a way of affecting the moral education of youth. And so that, that I think, is the, that's, that's a mea culpa. That it, it's, markets don't produce morality. And in the absence of morality, markets are pathological. This gentleman here in the middle. My name is Dominic Pino. I'm an intern here at Heritage. I'm also an economic student at George Mason. Um, and uh, I had so a you're question. one of those public choice people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, but I had a question a um, uh, little while back. Kevin Williamson wrote a piece in National Review uh, about capitalism and how people, when they're surveyed, they say they don't like capitalism. His argument is that people don't really hate capitalism. They actually hate banks, airlines, credit, uh, 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 insurance companies, and cable companies. Um, you never hear people really complaining about grocery stores or Walmart or any of these things. Um, well, I do, but I'm a dude. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, uh, what do you think of that? And what do you think of, and then he points out that those are some of the most regulated industries, of course. Um, and so what do you think of that argument and that the problem there is not actually capitalism, it's government overregulation? I'm afraid I'm going to make a lot of y'all mad. I actually worry that that's a problem of a capitalist system in a democracy, the tendency to seek at the margin rent-seeking opportunities instead of profit-producing opportunities. And if you're the CEO of a corporation and you're looking and you have a choice of hiring engineers or lobbyists, at some point, at some level of maturity, you'll find that hiring lobbyists is likely to produce more accounting profits. So I worry that we do the following two things, which are inconsistent. First, when I tell my colleagues at Duke, you know, socialism never works. Look at Venezuela. Oh, no, that's not socialism. Sweden, that's socialism. All right, but then they tell me the airlines, or look at Solyndra. And I say, oh, that's not capitalism. Well, if that's the direction that capitalism takes in a democracy, when it's in the government's interest to sell favorable policies because that's a way people can get reelected, then we are doing some of what we decry in others. So I, although I think Kevin Williamson is right, I think we need to worry about saying, oh, no, that's not capitalism. That's what people see. So that's what we need to say is that's a pathology of capitalism in the following sense. It is there's a complicity with government. And I actually think, and I might as well go whole hog if I'm going to make people mad, the person who saw this most clearly was Karl Marx. I actually give on uh, my final exam for one of my graduate classes a list of quotations from Karl Marx and a list of quotations from George Stigler about the extent to which regulation is chosen by the industry itself. And it's pretty hard to distinguish. It's exactly the same theory that to the extent that the Chicago theory of regulation is accurate, we either need better CEOs who will resist the blandishments of these false profits. See what I did there? False profits, because it's rent seeking. Or better politicians who will say, no, no, that's wrong, even though it would help me get reelected. Well, if it produces more profits and if it produces reelection, we have a fundamental problem. Just uh, one point I'd like to make is that Sweden scores higher on the index of economic freedom than does the United States. So if we take away the high taxes. It's, yeah. it's, it's, 
Right. Well, in the aggregate, yeah. obviously, it does have higher taxes. Uh, the gentleman in the red shirt had his hand up a while ago. Hi, I'm Scott Kim. Um, I work for Senator Kennedy's, I was John Kennedy's office. So I agree with most of what you said, but I'm I'm not sure if like the left actually says that capitalism is bad for increasing material resources for everyone. Like you know, Marx said that we need capitalism in order to transition to um, communism. And in the same sense, like how do you deal with like sort of the notion that even though wages have gone up um, broadly under capitalism, uh, if you agree with like Thomas Piketty. Most of the way that um, wealth is generated now is through asset holding. And even though most middle Americans do hold asset holding, even though they don't know it through their 401ks, it's really not the same as like people like, say, like Warren Buffett and people like that who have like so many sort of asset producing resources. And it's really hard to like have, a, and it's really hard to say move up in an economy where a lot of the sort of ways in which you move up is just holding assets. Well, to be fair, when I say the left, I don't mean in Congress. I mean in the Duke Sociology Department. So the, the real left that would say it's actually evil on its face. And remember, Marx's claim was we will use capitalism to develop enough capital so that we can take all of it and give it to the people, not that we will leave it in the hands of those who have earned it. So the, the Piketty question is certainly interesting. Um, it might very well be true that you're seeing a concentration of assets in relatively fewer hands. But as I tried to demonstrate, even those in the bottom quintile are still getting better off. And they're already in the top 15% of the world income distribution. So the question is, do we want the poor in America to become better relative to everyone else in America? Or are we going to be satisfied with them getting better relative to the rest of the world? Which probably the second standard is the one that's possible given the size of our population. I have to admit, though, that I have, partly for reasons that you bring up, argued for universal basic income. So chapter 6 of my book, Tomorrow 3.0, says that given the insecurity of income that's likely to come from the disappearance of many kind of traditional jobs, something like universal basic income would, at a minimum, reduce the sense of political turmoil that's likely to result in something even worse. So if you look at the origins of the German welfare state, Otto von Bismarck was not a leftist. He was concerned about keeping the cities of Europe from catching fire in the response to the Industrial Revolution. So the, the, the moral question you raise is an important one. I think just for political reasons, some form of universal basic income would be better than the, than the hodgepodge system that we have now that impose a benefits cliff. The, the marginal tax rate on, for many people who are very poor, if you look at the taking away of their benefits, they're facing a marginal tax rate of 60 80%. So the, I, I, I would credit the argument that you made, it, politically at least, and possibly morally. We have time for two or three more questions. This gentleman here. Hi, uh, my name is Enrique Carnero. I'm an intern here at the Allison Foreign Policy Center uh, Heritage. So my question is, by framing as an atavism the over, um, being overly concerned with inequality, um, does that not pose, could that not potentially pose a risk to the family, the institution of the family. Um, so in other words, how do you frame that as an atavism, but not let that, but, but like, it scales up when you're talking about society, but you don't let it affect family structures. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, that's why I gave two examples. Because the example of the grandmother, we can't do without. So I mean, she was re she was reacting as if those children were her family. She's trying to take care of those children. We depend on that impulse. The question is, 
when it comes to economics, when it comes to things like that headline in the New York Times, we have to recognize that we need to have a, a, enough economic sophistication to diagnose what's actually going on. And I don't know what the, the solution to that is. We need to do both at the same time. So by calling it snake legs, yes, I'm dismissing it in a way that probably was, it's intended to be humorous, but it's too strong. On the other hand, if we don't recognize that we have this impulse that we should worry about, like the man who gets angry in a road rage incident and shoots someone who hasn't done anything, then economically we're doing a lot of that same thing. We're basically road rage incidents we go after someone who's made a lot of money because we think it's unfair, even though they've produced a lot of value for society. So I, we absolutely have to have both. And as I answered, as I tried to answer to a couple of questions, I guess I would like to separate and put logically prior an education, and as, as David said, this is some of the reason to have these talks in the first place, is to emphasize the importance of having moral education some kind of emphasis on character. I'm not sure public schools are capable of doing that. But I'm not that worried that if I think about this for five minutes, I don't know what the, the solution is. I'm satisfied with just saying that I think we have a problem. And at this point, we're not doing enough even to say that that's what the problem is. David Ditch, Heritage Foundation. Um, Quite oftentimes, the discussion between poverty and capitalism, the notion of poverty is fixated on the urban poor. But lately, uh, America has been roiled by the rural poor and the response to rural poverty, or at least the attempted response of uh, restrictions on trade. Uh, could you perhaps talk about the relationship between atavism and protectionism? Napoleon said, or is said to have said, some of the things Napoleon said he didn't say, but mm. he is said to have said that his particular genius as a general was that he could make men die for little pieces of ribbon. And if he had more ribbon, he could have won more battles. Well, that's pretty cynical. But so we have this impulse to act as if we were part of a kin group if we go through some sort of training. And it could be military training. But it also could be the sort of tribalism that you see when people paint their faces blue in Cameron Indoor Stadium. So it, for, for a basketball game, we're playing UNC. So we, we have these uh, attachments that can be exploited by saying they're the, they're the out group and we're the in group. And we're not automatically used to thinking, and this is your question, we're not used to thinking about impersonal cooperation. And markets are impersonal cooperation. If I go into Walmart and I want to buy a Blu-ray player, then I have rented part of a factory in China or Vietnam for about 30 seconds two months ago when they made that Blu-ray player. I don't know about it. I don't have to organize any part of it because it's there waiting for me in a box. But that's a kind of cooperation that is organized at such a distance, with such impersonality, that it's very hard for us to see. So the urban-rural question is difficult because the argument for free trade is unilateral. On the other hand, it is not true that free trade benefits everyone. It has winners and losers. And to the extent that people in rural areas see themselves rightly as having disproportionately paid the costs. So there were three or four counties in northern Alabama where until about 1980, almost half of all the socks in the world were made, these large hosiery mills. And now there's no, those hosiery mills are all closed. There's a city in China, Datang, that's referred to as Sock City. Within 50 miles of Sock City, almost two-thirds of all the socks in the whole world are made. The economies of scale and the division of labor are so enormous. Well, that means that I can go to Walmart and buy cheap socks. But the people in northern Alabama, those counties have unemployment rates of 30%. So the difficulty is that, it, it just as you say, I'm, just, I'm trying to agree with you. It's just taking me a long time to do with it. The, the rural poverty and the quite right sense that 
they are not participating in the benefits of having a global economy represents a problem that I think a lot of economists, because we talk about things in the abstract and we talk about kind of cost-benefit analysis, the argument for free trade is unilateral at the country level. But the distributional consequences are really difficult for many people who are the losers in globalization. So admitting that would make our argument much more persuasive rather than I mean, a lot of free trade economists will just say, oh, well, free trade's good for everyone. That's obviously not true. We have time for one more question. I thought I saw a hand up. Okay, I guess not. All right, well, thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you at some of our future events. And thank you, Dr. Munger, for an excellent presentation. Thanks for having me.